Good morning, everyone. This is Shaitali Bhatt, Chief of Bureau with Aviation and Defense Universe, today celebrating the Gunners Day. Well, we all know about Gunners Day, and it is going to be on 28th of September. Every year we celebrate, we commemorate this day as Gunners Day because it has, it has a significance, which is the raising of the five Bombay Mountain Battery on 28th of September, 1827. We are highly privileged to have with us, as all ADU team members know him very well by now. With, he has been always been us with us uh, uh, in every Gunners Day, at every Gunners Day. We have with us retired Major General Dr. P.K. Chakravarti, VSM former Additional Director, General Artillery, to speak with us on this day. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks for your time. And to take this discussion ahead, we have with us Editor Sangeeta Saxena, ADU. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you very much, Atali. Wonderful to have you, General Chakravarti, with us on ADU's chat room. It's just the right day, sir, for a person like you with RT in his blood, if I might say so. And uh, it's going to be a great discussion, I'm sure, for a day which is so important for us. India is marching ahead, sir, marching ahead and along with the clarion call the Prime Minister and the today's government has given, which is Make in India and Atman Nirbhar Bharat. And RT has actually been a trailblazer. And if we see, it is actually the arm which has showed us the right way to take the Make in India ahead. Welcome, sir. So let's try and get it from you. You are the best person to tell us, sir, what is the status of Make It India and RT today, sir, Indian artillery? Uh, thank you, Chaitali, and thank you, Sangeeta, firstly, for inviting me to the program on this great occasion of the Gunners Day. And I would like to, very before I get on to Atman Nibbar, I would like to say artillery today has become extremely important because of the Ukrainian war which started on 24th of February this year and is still continuing, possibly with a renewed uh, initiative from the Russians. And artillery has been the predominant arm, if I may put it. It has proved itself on the battlefield and today all types of issues, I mean, say, I remember someone from the United States coming and saying that, you know, as far as the cannon artillery is concerned, it's not important. They were going in for a vehicle called the striker. Okay, now you find that the United States has already imported Hamas to Ukraine. They are speaking that it's just not enough. We need cannon artillery. And as far as we are concerned, I think the artillery has come a great way in undertaking what is known as Atman in Bar, or shall I put it, undergoing a process of self-reliance. Undoubtedly, you are aware that I mean to say, we have to thank, I think, firstly, the user, that is the regiment of artillery, all the people involved, the DG or downward, we have to thank the DIDO, and we have also got to thank the academia, thank the journalists, and thank the private sector in taking this arm forward. So as far as artillery, everything is indigenous. I was very fortunate to meet the authorities and they made it very clear that we are going in purely for indigenous. I'll just give you an example for the 155, which is 52 caliber. We have the ATAX, which is an indigenous gun, probably one of the best. We are now going in for it instead of the other Israeli guns and all, which have also passed the test. That is a major news. And I think it's a major factor for making the Indian industry feel so proud. Next, I wanted to speak is about the K-9 Vajra, which is nothing but the K-9 Thunder. We have a plant which the LNT has, and today we had ordered only 100 pieces. The best part is this was meant for the deserts, not even for the plains. Then when I talk of deserts, I'm talking of basically, you know, the southernmost sector in our, what you call, geographical boundary with our Western adversary. But today it's in Eastern Ladakh. It's proving itself there. And then also as far as the ultra right houses are concerned, well, we got the initial lot, which today was manufactured in the United States, but Mahindra is taking on the manufacture now. 
And so even that is being made. Apart from that, I mean to say practically, if you look at it, every equipment, you take the Dhanush, which is also now finding its way, if they are probably being able to overcome many of the problems which are involved in it. And if you look at finally, the most important, what is the weapon of the art? It's the ammunition. Now, ammunition was being manufactured indigenously, but was being manufactured previously only by the Ordnance Factory Board. Today, the government has opened it up to the private sector. And with that, I see that what you call we should have no problems of ammunition. If you take the Ukraine war, both sides are facing problems of ammunition. The Russians as well as the Ukrainians, more so the Ukrainians, because all their equipment has been got from outside. The Russians are definitely well off. They are able to manage. So the best part is ammunition, which is a major worry in case of a prolonged war. We can't say that we will not fight a prolonged war because I think the Ukrainian war has made one thing very clear. All types of wars will go on. So we need to be Atman Nirbhan in ammunition. I'm happy to see companies like Solar and one or two other companies, which I just met at a seminar a few days back, they are producing these items. So that's it of what I have for you. I think the art artillery is well on its path for indigenization and we are fulfilling the desires of the government and the private industry. Sir, I had a very basic question. You just touched on to the OFB. Now, earlier we were totally dependent and I know you said that the private sector also has a clearance. But what I want to understand, sir, is that this breaking off of OFB into uh, seven different parts, has it affected the uh, you know, ability of uh, the Indian artillery to keep itself absolutely abreast with everything intact and everything ready? Uh, has it created a real uh, problem for uh, the Indian artillery? Uh, these could be the only two thoughts. So which one do you think is correct? Sir? I think uh, the present uh, path which the government has adopted is a pragmatic path. It's a path which has helped not only the artillery, but possibly everybody to be more focused. Uh, today, when you take the public sector unit, which is dealing with ammunition, or public, which is dealing with armament, they are absolutely not only focused, they are looking at indigenization, they are looking at fulfilling the orders, they are no longer speaking that you give us an intent and you are dependent, that sort of language has disappeared. A uh, focused approach, which is, I'll put it, the commercial approach has come in, which I think is a big win-win situation for the artillery for the nation and for everybody. And as far as the ammunition is concerned, which was purely the preserve of, shall I put it, as per the Explosives Act, you know, it required parliament sanction for some things, for the explosives to be particularly. It is now today being made by the private sector. Not only are they making it, they are allowed to now export it. Look at the beauty. So today, see, once you get the private sector in, what happens is that they are able to do tasks not for getting pay, but for getting profit. There's a big difference between working for pay and working for profit. When you work for a profit, you cannot just fulfill the Indian Army's order or the Indian Navy's order or the Indian Air Force order. You look for them, how you can today carry out tweaking of your resources so that your plant continues to operate. I'm so happy to see them do it. I think it's a big step which has been taken by the government and I can say they have not even really done for OFB, they have done it for Air India. I think these are major steps which have happened and you would be knowing much more than me on these because after all you deal with aviation. You can see the way today when you go to an airport, I just have been flying all over the world. I see Air India aircrafts today and their crew and their this thing is something to be seen. Similarly, the DPSUs, they are not, today the DPSUs, we met, they're very, very focused. They are looking at targets, they are looking at profits, they are talking to you, sir, this is indigenous, we can only do this much. So they are coming out not with promises that we can do, but they are speaking of two things, the know-how and the know-why, which is, I think, very good. And sir, uh, as in when we go ahead, 
there is one very important factor which we, we need to understand that once you have an indigenous OEM making the final gun, it also means that uh, we have a huge set of supply chain which is created. Well, how would you try and uh, put this uh, supply chain into focus here? Uh, do we have a su sufficient supply chain or are these OEMs still dependent on the foreign supply chain? I think it's a very, very good question because see, the supply chain, when you start an initial manufacture of any equipment, I'll not talk of Indian equipment as I, because I asked someone who was very well known to me in a seminar a few days back a question. And I brought out to him that the iPad has most of the components made outside the United States. Boeing, an aircraft which I just traveled, I mean, say, um, both from uh, New Delhi to Frankfurt and Frankfurt to Houston. It was a 7478 of the Lufthansa. About 80% of the components are made outside, many of them in China. So they are doing integration. So, well, what you have brought out is something very, very important that the supply chain must continue. And the Ukraine war has brought out that today, if the supply chain stops, like say we with Russian equipment, if the supply chain stops, how do you carry out the manufacture indigenously? Naturally, that means the number of components which you manufacture indigenously must go up. Like say today, you've got an automotive industry. The semiconductors have become... Well, that one is the demand has also gone up for everything, particularly if you take cars, because due to COVID, people felt that the, what you call public transport often does not work. Why due to COVID? There were heavy rains in Gurgaon or the other day. I had to go to an eye specialist and atropine had to be put in my eyes. There was no Uber. There was nothing. I finally went on the road and then got somehow some transport, paid him what you call much more than what he's supposed to go and then reach. Because if I took my car, I wouldn't be able to drive it back. So the basic issue, what you brought out is the supply chain is extremely important for all components. Now, there are many ways of resolving it. One is by seeing that, okay, shall, shall we put it that our policies are such that we are able to get the supplies in a way that, see, like, I think we have got excellent relations with everybody. But don't forget, even China is a supply, is a part of the supply chain, which, which is, I think, the interesting part. How do we get components from there? How do we get components from countries which, let's say, Russia today may not be able to get it because they were getting it from some other countries which have stopped. So this has something which needs to be resolved at the government level, at the private sector level, and it is not something which I can answer just you know here. But possibly one has to keep writing about it so that people look into it. And a uh, lot of people are addressing this issue. And uh, really speaking, it is a serious issue which you have brought out. I only hope that people look into it. When you look into it, it's like getting water into your home. It will only come if you are interested. Otherwise, the water may be there in the neighboring house, but it will not come and you'll go with your bucket over there. The same thing is for a supply chain. It is a constant look at issues. That's what I can see right now. And so when we talk about uh, ammunition, we talk about the OEM making the actual weapon. We also talk about skilling of the man behind the weapon, sir. So what is generally, you were ADG of the core and you know, what was generally the process and does it still continue? How well are we in the plan of skilling our soldiers who are behind the guns? Uh, let me put it to you, Sangeeta. Uh, our human beings, you might say our recruitment or people come mainly from the rural background. Uh, well, the Indian, uh, I, I wouldn't get into what is our, why our brains are so good. You see an Indian person anywhere. By nature, he is innovative. You travel all over the world. You'll find that our community is occupying key positions wherever innovation is involved. Let it be any country in the world. You'll find that we are innovative by nature. And when we are innovative by nature, you definitely learn the process. Let's say I think... Personally, I feel I got the Bofors gun and I was a major. 
and I had to train my boys. Believe me, uh, our boys were not even tenth class pass in their time, seventh class. And the Americans said, "Well, it's highly technical. We can't handle this gun." Can you imagine the American army saying that? I met them there. The Norwegians said it's highly technical. We got it here. So when we devise processes, I think it's for the officers to find ways and means of getting technology into your bloodstream. Now, how do you do it? See, we have a like in our unit. I'll say, say something we did. See, we had to uh, do with computers. We had come, you know, very automatic components on the gun. So, in the roll call every day, we used to have in the whole unit. We used to have RT. So, uh, before the RT, we used to revise all these drills in an informal way. And the net result was when we fired, we fired and we made drive. And ours was a light regiment. It converted into an 155, from 120 to 155, something which is unthinkable. A man was driving a small one ton. He came to a Scania, and Scania, unfortunately, was not a right. You know, the steering was on the opposite side, and driving on Indian roads with a steering on the opposite side. That is, your steering is normally, as you know, on the right side. In our case, the Scania, the steering was on the left side. The boys could do it outstandingly well. They could take it to high altitude. It's a question of application, practice, and I think by and large, technology is simple if you practice it. It's not easy, but I think so. Therefore, our people will adapt to these equipment. They have adapted everywhere. I've seen them. It's not very, very difficult, provided even today, after retirement, I've been involved with firing as a general, and you would agree. I mean, just something firing missiles, firing guns. And when you do that yourself, then the men automatically. There's nothing, you know, very uh, technical about all these things. Everything is technical to me. In the world, there's nothing which is not technical. But still, at this age, I'm buying a new car. They wanted to give me the, what is it, the automatic system. I've opted for the manual system. Now, the reason being why I opted for the manual is that my brain remains okay, my eyes remain okay, and while driving, I have the synchronization to be able to do it. So there you are. Everybody likes automatic nowadays, particularly when you're moving. You know it, what is it? I mean, everybody told me, you must buy automatic. My son from the United States said, you must buy automatic. But, well, I felt that I must carry on with this. So that is it. Right, the sir. The All right, sir. Absolutely, sir. And then, and uh, you know, when you're moving towards the end of the chat, sir, I, my last question to you would be that we have two not so very friendly neighbors, and uh, at the moment, in the situation which is there, uh, is is our artillery the state of the art and the best to combat any contingency, sir? Well, uh, see. Listen, I would not like to give a picture which is surreal. Okay, we have two adversaries which are well known, and both are professional adversaries. I always learned how to respect them, and I found that the only way we can contest them is by being professional and by going into what they are doing. Well, let me put it to you, they are both modernizing at a very fast pace. Well, uh, whatever we bought, we have taken it to high altitude. We have taken it to the deserts. We can take it to the plains. And the best I can just say to, today to you, Bharat Forge, I saw a gun with their made, 155-39 caliber, mounted on a truck. Which they are exporting. And the beauty is today, Indian Army and the Deputy Chief of Army staff just announced a few days back that Indian Army is prepared to test and try equipment which it is and certify it, which even it is not going to use, so that these companies can export it outside. So, therefore, that should send a message. If others are buying it, I think we can definitely contest them. The artillery is deployed. So long as you can deploy it and you have your equipment there, that's the big thing. 
Once you have it there, then you need the ammunition. That is also there. And then you need the method of replenishment, which is nothing but a supply chain. That being in high altitude, you need some stocking to be done. I think all these have been done vis-a-vis -vis both our neighbors. The Western neighbor, we were always ready. As far as the northern neighbor is concerned, he has a huge frontier. He keeps changing his uh, posture. Today it is Eastern Ladakh. Tomorrow it may be Arunachal. The after it may be some other place. I'm going to say one really does not know what is happening in Nepal. So we have to be prepared. But I think we have the capability of firstly moving, secondly of getting the ammunition. And whatever be the situation, we have got to respond. We will not be reactive. This is what I would say. And therefore, we can prove ourselves. Absolutely, sir. East or West, India is the best. And I'm sure we all agree with it. And this was wonderful speaking with you, sir, Gunners Day. And, you know, uh, just, just the right person to give us everything in the right perspective. Thank you very much, sir. We're taking you back to the other studio where Chatali, our bureau chief, is waiting for us. And I really hope that every year, Gunners Day, we have all such nice positivity on our screens. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. As usual, as ma'am said, yes, we really hope and wish that every Gunners Day, we have such very positive thoughts from you. And thanks for your time, sir. Hope to see you again. Hope to have you again in the next chat at the Gunners Day. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.